Why does God allow pain and suffering? Listen, pain and suffering is a reality of life. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to God's people. Sadly, what often follows disasters, devastation, discomfort, and distress, it isn't a dedication to the divine, but rather disbelief in a desirable deity. Pain and suffering typically produces a bout of doubt and it leaves us with the age-old question of why? Why? If God exists, why does God allow pain and suffering? Well, first, I will summarize the objection of pain and suffering. Then, I will summarize the argument for the necessity of pain and suffering. And then I will expound upon that summarized argument. So here's the objection. If God is all-powerful and all-good, pain and suffering would not exist. If God were all-powerful, God could prevent pain and suffering. If God were all-good, then he would prevent pain and suffering. Because both pain and suffering exist, either God doesn't exist at all, God is all good, but not all powerful, or God is all powerful, but not all good. That's the objection. So here's the, uh, the summarized argument. <gasps> well, the objection is false because it presupposes that the allowance of temporary pain and or suffering is an act of evil. From the beginning, it is important to recognize that without God, neither pain nor pleasure can be adequately explained. Think about that. Neither pain nor pleasure can be ad adequately explained without God. Without God, there's no purpose. Without purpose, both pain and pleasure are meaningless because they meet at the same end and become one in the finality of death. If life is purposeless, complaining about pain and suffering is senseless. Think about that. If life is purposeless, which is the case if we are not here for a purpose, <laughs> complaining about pain and suffering is senseless. Pain and suffering can only be questioned in the light of the existence of God. Pain and suffering serves a purpose. God is who God says he is. Now, who is God? Please see my other article. It's called, Who is God? But pain and suffering exists for many reasons, but all the reasons amount to one ultimate good purpose, even though suffering is not good in and of itself. Free will is absolutely necessary for love. And please see my other article, Do Humans Possess Free Will? And that'll explain that. But the fall was a failure out from free will not from a lack of God's goodness or power. Pain and suffering were not parts of the original plan, but they became reality due to the fall. Consequently, pain and suffering are now unavoidable in this part of the ultimate plan. The part of the ultimate plan where pain and suffering exist is what we know as life on earth. Suffering is a symptom of evil, which is the privation of the providential plan. Now, please see my other article about that. What about evil? I get into that. And, and don't worry, I'm going to get into the nitty-gritty about pain and suffering. I'm not going to try to evade anything. Moving on. Excuse me. Don't eat garlic before doing this. Noted. Humanity has fallen and is broken. Pain and suffering are constant reminders of our brokenness. Suffering is sickness from sin. Sin is the brokenness of the soul, a wound that is deep and systemic, and pain is the symptom. Pain is the acknowledgement of our brokenness. Suffering is the process of healing and restoration. Handling pain and suffering inappropriately increases the agony. The disconnect, the disconnect of the design from the designer demands death. That's in Romans 6.23. Now the split between the substance and the source should be a permanent separation from salvation. 
And again, I'm going to put scripture down in the uh, links and stuff below. I'll write everything out so you can also look at it as well. But only a sacrifice can save us from suffering. Due to the rebellion and rejection, only the resurrection could restore and redeem humanity. It is necessary to experience pain and suffering in this life, in earth, if life is to be fully lived, rightly understood, and truly appreciated. Without pain and suffering, celebration of restoration, it isn't possible. Current suffering will be memories of the past, which will cause the celebration in the future to be full of exuberance. Pain and suffering produces the humility necessary to prevent pride, which ultimately prevents another fall in the future. Proverbs 16, 18, for instance. <clears throat> when we truly comprehend God's goodness, we'll understand this limited life in context of the larger picture of God's unlimited love in eternity. This life on earth is merely a lengthy lesson that trains us and prepares us for the real life that is to come. So, how does one even make the charge that God is not doing the loving thing by allowing pain and suffering without presupposing how love is defined? If man becomes the measure of all things, then who is man or woman? whose definition supersedes all others. And that's why it's important to see my other article, Moral Relativism, because without an absolute moral standard, we can't live consistently in our beliefs as well. What would we know about love without suffering and sacrifice? Think about that. Would empathy be possible without pain and suffering? Would we truly be grateful for health without sickness, for life without death, for eyesight without the blind, for legs without the lame? Is someone grateful for food after having been hungry for a while? Is someone grateful for water after having been thirsty for a while? Doesn't a woman love and appreciate a good man all the more if she had previously been in an abusive relationship? Can a person understand and appreciate an entire song if all they heard of it was the first word of the first verse? It's kind of hard, isn't it? Doesn't the first few strokes of a paintbrush seem to be chaos on a canvas? Should we decide if a movie is good or bad only by watching the first few minutes or the first few words that come out? Is it a quid pro quo, a trade, this for that, that if you love someone, you will make his or her life completely free from any and all pain? Is that even possible? Further, does love always mean giving one the freedom to have or do whatever one wishes? Is it loving to remove boundaries? Can experiencing pain now for the benefit of some ultimate purpose in the future satisfy us in the moment? These are many things that we need to think about when considering pain and suffering. If people become skeptics about God in response to suffering, we must assume that the antidote, pleasure, must mean perpetual happiness. But that's simply not true. The pursuit of pleasure and happiness is ultimately meaningless without purpose. There is a purpose to pain and it is through suffering that one will truly understand salvation. And I'm going to get into this really deeply. <clears throat> From our limited perspective, the loving thing to do is to ease the pain of someone that you love. And if at all possible, eliminate any suffering. But is that truly what is best? Think about that. Is it possible that much of our pain and suffering is due to unrealistic expectations? Is it, re is it realistic and reasonable for us to expect a life without pain and suffering? 
Do you even comprehend what you're asking to receive or not receive? Would sacrifice be possible? Forgiveness? Reconciliation? Compassion? Courage? How could there be heroes? Love itself would even be called into question. Isn't the gap of understanding between human parents and a child great? Now, should we be surprised that the gap of understanding between God and humans is even greater? Is it possible maybe you just don't completely understand pain and suffering like we should? Women willingly go through the pain of giving birth because they rightly understand the blessing that they will receive after experiencing the pain that will inevitably come to an end. The parents also realize that by having a child, the parents will be risking the possibility of serious suffering for the child in life. The starting point of dealing with pain is to understand and accept that there is a purpose for our lives. If there is good reason to think that human procreation can be an act of love, despite its great cost, then there is also good reason to think that God's creation of the world we live in could be an act of love. Whereas human parents are often helpless to eliminate suffering in the lives of their children, God has the power to offer each created person the ultimate elimination of suffering in a heavenly and eternal home with him. Think about this. There is a rare congenital disease called CIPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with any drosis? Anhydrosis? I think that's how you say it. It's called CIPA. C-I-P-A. In short, look, the body simply does not feel pain with that. The body can still be wounded and even damaged beyond repair, but it simply cannot register the pain associated with such wounds, even if the wounds are life-threatening. Okay, therein lies the danger of the disease. Someone could get stabbed not realize it until it's too late due to the amount of blood loss. In contrast, think of a child who overreacts to a scary situation and believes the pain to be greater than it actually is. I mean, I once saw an adult place a harmless bug on the arm of a young child. Simply because the child was afraid of the unknown, he suddenly believed his situation to be more dire than it actually was and he cried while he screamed in the agony of pain! pain that the bug supposedly inflicted upon his arm. Yet the bug wasn't attacking the child. It was merely moving. It was a ladybug. In both cases, pain can be seen as something good, beneficial, and or necessary. Like in scenario one, the human doesn't feel pain, bleeds out, and dies because the reality of the situation wasn't understood rightly. In scenario two, the human experiences real suffering due to unwarranted perceived pain because the reality of the situation wasn't understood rightly. So perhaps our situation is not understood rightly when it comes to pain and suffering. Worldview must be put through the sieve of our reasoning process to examine if we have done justice to the facts and to logic or have merely forced conclusions from them that amputate other realities. And you can see my other article, Worldview. What is a worldview? But in the West, the difficulty behind the question is juxtaposing overall purpose and love. In the East, the problem is stated so that the focus is on the cause of a specific suffering and how to eliminate it. In the West, the material nature of life is central. In the East, the spiritual nature of life is central. In the West, the body debates the reality of the soul. In the East, the soul debates the reality of the body. In the West, the soul becomes an illusion. 
In the East, the body becomes an illusion. In the West, the pursuit of control over pain is the responsibility of society and the effort is made to eliminate pain. In the East, the pursuit of control over pain is the responsibility of the individual and the effort is made to eliminate the personal cause of pain and suffering by exulting in the pain and changing it from a negative to a positive. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis provides for us a good analogy by stating that when a ship is on high seas, it must answer three questions. First, the first is how to keep from sinking, and this is personal ethics. The second is how to keep from bumping into other ships, and this is social ethics. And the third is the most important of all, to know why the ship is out on the high seas in the first place. This is the essence of ethics. People often desire to present the problem of pain and suffering without offering a good solution as to why we are even able to experience it at all. Think about it. Why would it matter if your ship sank or bumped into other ships if there's no purpose to anyone sailing? Why are there boats? Why are we sailing? Where are we going? Why is there life at all? What is the meaning to life? Is there purpose? If not, then everything is random and meaningless and nothing matters because everything is mere matter. But if everything is mere matter and merely reacting rather than responding with purpose, how can a person even trust him or herself if he or she believes that he or she is experiencing pain and or suffering. Reaction of mere matter cannot be trusted for a reasonable response to a problem to produce a solution with preventative measures. In other words, mere matter merely reacts and cannot produce solutions to problems that do not yet exist, yet humans produce preventative measures, thereby responding rather than merely reacting. Why? Purpose has its place. If you're merely matter and not an everlasting soul, what does it matter? The abandonment of purpose opens the floodgate of nonsense and it closes the door for any reason to file a complaint at all for suffering. For if there is no purpose, then you should never expect joy or for things to go right. In a random and purposeless existence, pain and suffering should be expected due to the inevitable destruction due to chaos and disorder. Without intelligent design, all that exists is unintentional disaster. The purpose of life underlies all approaches to solving the mystery of evil and suffering. Without creative purpose, the atheist has no reason to complain. Without purpose, suffering is unexplainable. Without love, the meaning of life is unknowable. The strength of any explanation depends on the plausibility of alternative explanations. Explaining the absoluteness of evil within the theistic paradigm is far more rational than trying to explain the absolute of good within the atheistic paradigm. I'm going to get into this. How can anyone complain about what is bad unless we have a standard of what is good by which to compare? By whose definition is good known? What is good? Without God, there simply cannot be such an absolute as good, only something that is preferable over something else. Well, preferable to whom? The person experiencing whatever it is he or she prefers? A planet of self-centered feelings and desires can only come into contradiction and conflict with one another. Do you see what I'm saying? And that evil is precisely 
the privation of the providential plan that causes pain and suffering. Pain and suffering is the experienced evidence of the separation from the source. Now we often wish we could take suffering out of the world while keeping everything else the same, but it simply will not work. Think about it, changing, changing anything changes everything and everyone. How many people of greatness are great because of everything they endured and overcame? But then why would we call them great if they never overcame anything? Love comes at the greatest cost and when the cost is paid, brings the greatest reward. In creating this world, God didn't merely accept the cost, but he suffered the cost. The deepest betrayal is sin against the one who loves you the most. And though we deny him time and time again, Jesus chose to die for us on the cross. That's love at its best. And I'm gonna explain all this. I'm, I'm not trying to evade anything. I'll get to the pain and suffering of things. But think about it, justice demands judgment. Love demands mercy. Only at the cross of Jesus do we find both. Whew. Only at the cross do we find perfect love and perfect justice in perfect intersection. Where there is the possibility of love, there must be the reality of freedom. Where there is the reality of freedom, there must be the possibility of pain. Where there is the reality of pain, there is the need for a savior. Where there is a savior, there is the possibility of redemption. Jesus conquered evil by absorbing all our pain and suffering. Now knowing what we now know, who really suffers the most? Is it us in our temporary time or God who is rejected by his creation even after giving them life and dying for them? Jesus was literally dying to be with us. Jesus suffered hunger and overcame temptation. He had been betrayed, mocked, spit on and slapped, beaten, had the flesh of his body torn off. He was ridiculed. He thirsted for life, all while sacrificing himself for us. The cross is where God protested that it's not acceptable to merely look the other way when people are beaten, abused, enslaved, tortured, and murdered. Jesus' life reveals that he didn't only live for the absolute moral standard and holiness, but he was willing to die for sinners. He was willing to die for sinners. That's in Romans 5, 6 through 8. There are serious consequences for sin and the guilty will find themselves in hell. Now, a lot of people have a problem with hell. I understand this, unless you just are able to understand it better. So, please, see my other article. It's called, What About Hell? And I'll get into the details of hell there in that article. But Jesus will justly invite the least of all people into his presence for eternal joy in heaven. Jesus displayed his love in such an extravagant way that we have strong reason to trust him, even when we don't fully understand his ways. And truly, we're not going to completely comprehend God's ways while in this life on earth. Isaiah 55, eight to nine. All right, listen, in philosophy, this type of knowledge is referred to as non-propositional knowledge, which is to say that it can't be fully conveyed by words, by writing it down in a book to be read. Non-propositional knowledge can be known, but only by experiencing it firsthand. And think about this. Much of our knowledge is knowledge gained by experience, above and beyond anything that can be known by description or argumentation. 
We can explain love, but until you experience it, you'll never understand it. Something important to remember. Evil exists in time. Why is that important? God is eternal. Evil is here now, but will be quarantined later. Pain and suffering exists now, but will not exist later while we are with God in eternity. We already know how the story ends. God knows that one day soon, he will take us out of suffering and into a great state of joy. God will wipe away every tear. And that's in Isaiah 25, 8, Revelation 7, 17, and Revelation 21, 4. God also knows that from the perspective of eternity, the period of time spent in pain and suffering will be remembered as a mere moment, like it was a dream that we woke up from. Imagine someone getting trapped in a burning house, but then being rescued, pulled out by the firefighters. Would that one moment of fear within a lifetime be enough to say that the life itself was horrible? Even if that person died in the fire, the time spent in suffering on earth will be but a mere moment. Life here on earth might seem like a raging fire, but that fire does eventually get put out and a new house will be built. That's what happens when God brings us to the new heaven and new earth. Please read about it in Revelation chapter 21. But I wonder how much suffering results from unrealistic expectations and from wishing we were someone else. Think about that. God never wishes you were anyone else. But God does desire for you to be somewhere else, with Him. And we will be one day. And on that day, we will all understand that what we believe to be horrible life, it was actually the greatest lesson that will become our amazing attitude of great gratitude in the life to come. You have to look at the entire painting, not the mere first few brushes, the strokes that you see on the canvas. We must see life in the context of the entire picture of eternity. If the bad you're experiencing right now will help you comprehend the goodness of your life to come, is it truly that bad? Death and loss, this is a part of my testimony. Pain and suffering was a part of my salvation. I decided to become a follower of Christ, Jesus, back in 2004 at the age of 21. Why? Why did I become a Christian after experiencing death, pain, suffering, all that? Please, go see my other article. It's called My Testimony, From Agnosticism to Atheism to Christianity. And if you're truly stuck on this pain and suffering, even more so in like evil, please go see my other article, What About Evil? I really dive into that one.